Oh, if you want a new dimension in watching television, you need a pair of these glasses. They're special 3D specs, and you've only got three weeks to get hold of a pair. They'll cost you 99p, and 25p of the purchase price goes directly to this year's Children in Need appeal. Now, over the past few months, some of the top programmes on BBC television have been making special 3D films. And on the night of Children in Need, I shall be introducing the first part of a special Doctor Who spectacular, featuring five of the Doctors together in Albert Square. And just a few days ago, we sent a non-3D camera along there just to do a bit of snooping. And action! Time traveller, baby. Genius operator. The doctor's arch rival, the the Rani, has landed him in. Albert Square, and she's pushing him backwards and forwards in time. Well, the, uh, the Doctor's characters change, the incarnations, and the East Enders get older and younger as the story progresses. Madam, what year is this? 2013! And that's as far as I'm going to go. I'm not going to tell you any more. <laughs> it's, no, it's no good. <laughs> we're in there in different time zones. To them, we're the strangers. Oh, you might hit the camera. Sorry. Thank you. Stop recording. Yes, very good. Very good indeed. Are these the specs we can buy in the shop? These? No, 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 no. These are the executive model. They're called producer's perks. In fact, these are the ones that you'll get in the shops. Wow! Look at that! The 3D element is a very exciting uh, element indeed. The, the script has been specially written, tailored for 3D, so that there's a lot of action, a lot of movement, all of which looks magnificent um, you know, in 3D. Well, the East Enders cast, I think, have really enjoyed it, and so many of them have literally walked up to us and, and said, you know, I'm in the studio today, I've got my costume on, I've got my makeup on, can you somehow fit me in? Join? We three in 3D for, for children, children in, in need. need. Oh. <laughs> you can see part one of that adventure on Friday, November the 26th in Children in Need and the concluding part the next evening in My House Party. Here are the other BBC programmes in our fantastic 3D week. Blue Peter will be making a real 3D splash on Monday, November the 29th when I report on a dramatic story at sea. Yes, and I wonder who you'll be rescuing. <laughs> On Thursday, the 2nd of December, Top of the Pops enters the 3D zone with a special chart-topping performance. You'll think we're right there in your living room. And on Friday, December the 3rd, Tomorrow's World will reveal the tricks of the 3D trade and show how Doctor Who was made. So get your glasses on and join BBC One's 3D TV Week in aid of children in need. You can pick up your 3D specs at selected retailers and we've got details on our information line. We'll give you the telephone number at the end of the programme. Now, of course, we also want you to organise fundraising events on behalf of children in need. Here's what the firemen have... In half an hour, Doctor Who and the Daleks first on BBC One at the end of 3D TV week. Tomorrow's World shows us how it's done. isn't difficult to see, although, to be honest, there are going to be a few people who'll never see it at all. It's not actually a new idea for 3D. It's been used for television before, but never so ambitiously as in this past week. So, how does it work? The 3D we see in normal life relies on our brains processing two separate images from two slightly different viewpoints. Most 3D systems reproduce different views for each eye and various ways have been invented for getting two moving images to our eyes. The two-colour system is probably the best known, but as with all these systems, if you're not wearing the glasses, the picture you see is much worse than usual, useless for broadcasting. But the 3D shown on the Beeb this week looks normal to people not wearing the glasses.
That's because the effect doesn't rely on transmitting two separate images, but on a peculiarity of the way we see things. It's called the Pulfric effect. What it is, is that the eye and the brain actually take longer to process a dark image than a brighter one. That's why you've got a dark filter on one side of the glasses. That means that the brain gets information from the right eye a fraction of a second later than the left. Now, that delay can produce a 3D effect when something's moving on your TV. Here's what happens. Say an object, in this case Carmen, moves across the screen from left to right. Now freeze a particular instant. What you see through the left eye with the light filter is Carmen here. But through the right eye with the dark filter, you see Carmen back here, where she was a 50th of a second ago. The brain, always keen to make sense of what signals the eyes are sending it, fuses the two separate images together and places the object where the two lines cross, here, apparently closer to the viewer. With an object moving the other way, it's reversed. Through the left eye, it's here. Through the right eye, here. And now the lines cross further away. So there's nothing special about the technology at our end, a perfectly normal TV camera pointing at this carousel. Try looking at it through the glasses. The things in the foreground are moving right, and the ones in the background moving to the left. Well, it's a treat. Now, let's prove the point. Change the direction of the carousel, and the effect disappears. But now, try turning your glasses the other way around, and you should see it again. Got it? Well, it can happen with all sorts of moving objects. Bits of football match or the 315 at Aintree may end up in 3D. All this explains why the 3D pieces you've seen this week have never stopped moving. The technique requires a bit of careful planning, not to say choreography, but probably the biggest challenge is 3D drama. We followed the BBC team making the new episode of Doctor Who, shown last weekend. <laughs> It brought back some familiar faces, but it also brought together a lot of technicians, designers and camera experts to make it work. When was the last time you had that junk keeping for an MOT professor? Oh, don't be cynical, eh? It's just the instruments are just a little erratic, that's all. Great, well, the, the trick of the whole thing was to stage the movement to create the best 3D effect. A real challenge for the director, Stuart MacDonald. It takes perhaps a bit longer than it would simply shooting a, a regular drama. One of those reasons is that the shots, by definition, have got to be on the move most of the time. And if the camera isn't moving, the people certainly have to be. And so you've got to get three or four people to move in particular directions when they're doing their right line and so on. And the scenery plays an important part too. OK, so we can slowly fill up the foregrounds. Yeah, OK. For objects in the foreground to stand out, the camera must track past them so they cross the picture from left to right. We are running up to the pause. Oi! Is anybody there? Good. Now, what about the other foreground? I, I think it looks like a classic serial. It's the barrel work. Mm -hmm. We're going to reduce the barrel work. They place things in front of you, whereas before, normally, that's all clear, so you can be seen. But they give depth of field. All right, so the props are there, sort of prominently in front, so you Yes, can they're upstaging you. Oh. Get away, prop. <laughs> Maybe actors don't like that. It has to be very much an action adventure rather than a, a close dialogue situation because obviously the minute you get into close-ups, uh, there is no real 3D element unless you move the camera. And by moving the camera, quite often you'll move from one side of the face to the other, which gives you enormous grammar problems in terms of cutting the shots together. What's very important, of course, is that every shot doesn't look the same. If you're not, if you're not careful, you, you, you always have a bit of railings in the foreground moving in one direction, or you always have a car always moving in that direction, and so on. So um, we're aware of the movements, but the real trick is how to vary them within the context of, of the drama piece. So is there a future for this kind of technique? I think its application in drama, per se, is a little limited in that it has to be something that's really specially written for it in order to make it work. I think that a, a 30 minute drama or, or even a 25 minute drama, all in 3D, might get a little wearing. So how have you found wearing the glasses? <laughs> well, I've enjoyed them no end. These are the, the executive model, um, the producer's perks, as they're called, which have uh, that capability on them. I must say, I put these on, you look three dimensional both ways. But that's because you are. And that's the point. 
Competing with the sense of depth we get in real life is no easy job. The idea of 3D TV, though, seems so seductive that people are bound to keep on trying.